turn down this very nice elevator music. That would be cool. Ha! Huh. We are listened to. Think the digital world is functioning, or maybe it's local. But thank you. So, um, welcome to this uh, hybrid session um, on um, regulatory challenges of addressing advanced technologies, including but not only AI. Uh, my name is Thomas Schneider. I work for the Swiss government and I uh, currently happen to be the chair of the Council of Europe's Committee on AI that is tasked with negotiating a convention uh, on AI, ideally not just with European country, but countries, but also with interested countries from other continents. Um, but this is not about me, of course, this panel, so I will immediately um, hand on the floor to <clears throat> first uh, our keynote speaker, Jan Kleissen, uh, who is the, uh, the Director of Information Society and Action and Against Crime uh, at the Council of Europe, and his director carries out standard setting, monitoring and cooperation activities on freedom of expression, data protection, AI, internet governance, cybercrime, terrorism, criminal law, fighting corruption and money laundering, inter alia. Um, so uh, Jan, over to you and let us start. Introduction, I'm afraid of first sentences, but I think the sound is now okay. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Very good, very good. So, uh, greetings from a cold and rainy Strasbourg uh, to sunny Ethiopia here. Uh, it's a privilege for me, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity uh, to provide you with some information on the work of the Council of Europe and Artificial Intelligence. So the, uh, the IGF um, is, a, is a very particular forum for discussing all matters digital, and I have been honoured to participate in, in, in various uh, sessions for, for well over um, 12, 15 years now, I think, uh, and uh, we very much appreciate the possibility to be able to exchange, of course, not only with our usual uh, European interlocutors, but also very much with states around the world. As always, the Council of Europe is organizing a series of events on the, um, uh, at the IGF. Uh, this time we will be uh, organizing with the UN Office on Genocide Prevention and the Responsibility to Protect, uh, a session on combating hate speech. We'll also have a workshop on cyber attacks and e-evidence, uh, drawing attention, of course, to the work of our um, uh, Cyber Crime Convention uh, mechanism, the TCY, the Octopus Program, and of course the latest protocol to that Cyber Crime Convention. Uh, and tomorrow we are also organizing a session on promoting democratic culture online through digital citizenship uh, education. So as you can see, a whole variety of issues being handled by the Council of Europe at this at this IGF. Today, I'm very honored to be able to speak to you, as I mentioned, on the work on, on artificial intelligence, particularly honored because this session is chaired uh, by the chair of the Council of Europe's Committee on Artificial Intelligence, Mr. Thomas Schneider, and the vice chair, uh, Mr. Gregor Stoyan, is also participating in the, in the uh, se session. So anything I forget uh, or fail to mention, I'm sure, will be addressed by them. Perhaps a few words of introduction on the Council of Europe. We'll try to stick to the allotted time, of course, but just a few words to, to stress that the Council of Europe is very distinct from the European Union. Uh, the Council of Europe brings 46 member states together. It is Europe's oldest uh, political organization, uh, and it strives to promote human rights, rule of law and democracy uh, through a variety uh, of ways. Uh, but primarily through legal cooperation and agreeing on common standards in the form of treaties. So not just political recommendations or mere statements, uh, but treaties. And the Council of Europe has some 200 uh, plus treaties, binding treaties now, of which uh, a whole series uh, are open also to non-member states. Also, the Council of Europe realized very early on that in order to protect human rights, rule of law and democracy, one had to address new technologies, which is why 40 years ago, 
the Council of Europe established the world's first treaty on data protection, the Convention 108, which has now been ratified by 55 states and uh, more than 70 countries participate also in, in as a number of them as observers in, in its work. Uh, some 21 years ago, the Council of Europe established the Cybercrime Committee that I already mentioned uh, and on which a workshop will, will, whose work, workshop will be organized. And uh, that convention was recently ratified by Nigeria as the 67th ratifying state. And last year, the Council of Europe was active in more than 130 countries worldwide in every continent uh, to help with capacity building and uh, for the parties of the convention, the implementation of the convention obligations. So it is no surprise that uh, the Council of Europe realized also that artificial intelligence was an issue, uh, a technology that with all the fantastic benefits it brings, uh, can also have a real impact on human rights, rule of law and democracy. Which is why in uh, 2019, uh, a committee was set up by our governments, the 40, then 47, because uh, the Council of Europe uh, has uh, expelled this year uh, the Russian Federation because of its aggression against Ukraine. So uh, the member states established a, a committee with two tasks in 2019. First, to assess whether new regulation, new law was necessary with regard to artificial intelligence. And secondly, if the answer to that first question, do we need anything more, was yes, to already identify what elements, what, what should be dealt with in such a new legal instrument, possibly a treaty. At the end of 2020, despite the pandemic, uh, the committee, it was called CAHAI, and it was chaired by uh, a co-panelist, co uh, Mr. Gregor Stroyan, uh, unanimously answered the first question, namely, yes, there are important gaps. Existing regulation is not sufficient. We need new, new legal principles um, to ensure that artificial intelligence will not interfere with human rights, rule of law, democracy, but on the contrary, foster these values. The uh, committee, this committee uh, then went on uh, in its second year, in 2021, to identify a number of elements that could usefully be put in the form of what was then still called a possible legal instrument and presented this report at the end of 21. Again, unanimously. Uh, on the basis of that report, the uh, Council of Europe started this year to negotiate a treaty. It was decided that the legal instrument should be binding. It should, in other words, be a treaty. We hope the world's first treaty on, on artificial intelligence and human rights, and that these negotiations started this year. And as I said, Mr. Thomas Schneider was elected the chair and Mr. Troy Inverse, vice chair of this committee. We are at the table, not just, I think this is important to stress in the context of the IGF, we're at the table not just with 46 member states, but also uh, the EU as such is represented. Uh, and uh, we have our observer states, the United States, Canada, Mexico, Israel, uh, uh, sorry, Japan, and the United States. And in addition, Israel, which I uh, mentioned a second ago, uh, not an observer state, but made an hoc request to be admitted to the negotiations and is also fully participating. In addition, uh, we have 24 business partners, so-called digital partners, uh, global companies, tech companies, um, uh, including Meta, uh, in, this, in this panel, uh, but also Meta's competitors and um, a series of smaller European uh, associations of internet service providers, also telecoms, also standard setters like IEEE. Um, and so the business community is very much represented uh, as is uh, civil society and academia. So it's a truly multi-stakeholder stakeholder process. That it is urgent to address human rights aspects of artificial intelligence has become clear uh, throughout the world in a number of, of cases where governments use artificial intelligence and the results were not always what was hoped for. And in certain cases, such as a particular scandal that it involved or a tragedy, I should say, because it led to loss of life uh, in my own country, 
where the tax authorities uh, used uh, artificial intelligence to detect fraud with regard to child benefits. Um, and the system got it dramatically wrong. Um, as I said, it led to deaths. A number of people committed suicide. 1,600 children were taken away from their parents. The government fell. Um, and uh, it was a, a dramatic demonstration of what can happen if there is insufficient governance of AI, if the process, if the uh, right boxes are not ticked, if the process is not supervised. Um, this and, and other examples that uh, arose around the world uh, made the Committee of Ministers realize that not only should we negotiate a treaty, we should also do it fast. And therefore, the Council of Europe uh, has a deadline of the 15th of November, 2023. So within one year, minus one week, uh, the draft treaty should be presented uh, to our governments. That is a tall order. And many of you will uh, be aware of treaty negotiations in the context of the United Nations, for instance, and other or other regional organizations. And uh, you will probably agree with me that negotiating a treaty within a year is, is really very ambitious. However, as I mentioned, uh, we have two years of preparatory work behind us where elements were identified uh, already very much in detail. And we therefore think that it is possible to negotiate this treaty within, uh, within a year. The efforts of the Council of Europe are very much complementary to that of other international organizations. Uh, OECD, UNICEF, have, of course, have their own work on principles regarding AI. And the European Union is working on the European Union's AI Act, uh, which is, uh, was conceived initially as an internal market uh, effort, therefore dealing with the products, ensuring the products are safe. The Council of Europe approach is very much on procedure to ensure that when governments use uh, artificial intelligence themselves or allow others to use artificial intelligence in ways that affect or may affect human rights and the rule of law, uh, that a number of uh, safeguards are building. And during this session, you'll hear more of, of those. Um, they are, and you will not be surprised by the substance, uh, many of them are based on what already exists in the many ethical charters uh, that have been developed around the world. However, these ethical charters, of course, are not binding. They don't confer rights upon citizens and they cannot be invoked uh, before court. They're not translated into national legislation. We very much hope that the Council of Europe's convention as a global convention and the cybercrime convention I mentioned earlier, uh, I think is the example we would like to follow, that it will uh, be, that its provisions will be uh, transposed into national law and therefore will provide real rights and also real remedies uh, to, to our citizens. The substantive provisions uh, in the convention are, will be supplemented by another document, which is a human rights rule of law and democracy impact assessment. We believe it is essential that before resorting, before using artificial intelligence on behalf of public authorities, or in other words, before delegating to machines work that traditionally is carried out by qualified human beings, uh, that the impact of that decision are properly assessed. We're developing this particular tool in cooperation with the Alan Turing Institute in the United Kingdom. And the idea is that it will be linked to the treaty, but in such a way uh, that it is, can be updated more easily than a treaty can be, and so as to remain flexible and take care of future technological developments. But impact assessment is really, uh, in, our, in our mind, a key, a key element um, of course, the human rights, rule of law and democracy impact, but also the environmental impact. Um, you know that in order to train artificial intelligence systems, uh, a lot of energy is needed. And of course, the question always arises, is, the, is a very marginal increase in accuracy worth an enormous investment in an enormous carbon footprint? Uh, footprint? So these are additional questions to be, to be asked. Um, we look very much forward to the discussion. Uh, we hope that many of you will also consider uh, following the, the 
discussions in, in Strasbourg in, in more detail, uh, possibly uh, requesting to, to join them. Uh, and uh, we, of course, uh, are very interested to learn from you, from our partners all over the world, how you are progressing with regard to this very urgent question, how can such a powerful uh, and in principle, very uh, positive technology like artificial intelligence be harnessed for the good? Uh, and how can we ensure that uh, either by mistake or by design, it's, uh, it could be uh, used to um, or could lead to human rights violations uh, or undermining the rule of law and democracy. Look very much forward to discussions and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan. <clears throat> and for those that are afraid that this is a Europe only session, uh, of course, uh, this is not going to be the case. We have uh, experts from, from several continents. And, and let me just start to, to, to give the floor to the first speaker in the panel. Um, which is uh, from the African continent. It's Golestan, also called Sally Radwan. She is an international AI, ex AI expert and currently a PhD candidate uh, at the Royal Holloway University in London. But for the past three years, she served as the AI advisor to the Minister of ICT in Egypt, uh, where she uh, was also working on the national AI strategy. She has also been a vice chair of the UNESCO's ad hoc uh, expert group that was tasking, tasked with, with the development of the draft uh, recommendation that you all know uh, on ethics and AI that was adopted last year. And she has uh, had a number of other functions. So um, let me address the question to you, Sally. Um, what, what have been the main challenges of dealing with something like AI um, <clears throat> on national level, but also on, on, on regional level in a country like, like Egypt or uh, others? How did you deal with them? Uh, what, what are you doing differently uh, than maybe in, uh, in other continents? And also an important question, I think, what is the role that international institutions, international organizations should play in helping to create a level playing field of AI, ideally across the globe. So Sally, please, over to you. Uh, great to be here again at uh, IGF. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, so we started uh, thinking about an AI strategy in Egypt in late 2018, early 2019. And at the time, it wasn't a given that every country in the world needed uh, an AI strategy. Um, and there were understandably um, a lot of um, fears, a lot of misunderstandings around AI. Uh, there was a link between um, AI and automation, especially in things like manufacturing. And, and there, was, there was this perception that uh, AI was this automation technology that is designed for developed countries that suffer from um, lack of um, human labor in sufficient numbers and therefore have invented this technology to replace human labor, which is not something that developing countries necessarily need to worry about. In fact, it can damage their economies and so on. I'm sure you all know the narrative. Um, luckily, this started changing a little bit and, and um, we had quite a, an intensive national debate about it. Um, and it started to, to shift a little bit towards um, AI is this technology, or, or I like to call it an, an umbrella of technologies that can help uh, achieve a developing country's uh, goals in line with the UN's SDGs, but also the local kind of aspirations and priorities of its citizens. And from that sprung the idea for an Egyptian national AI strategy. Um, and we decided to really emphasize the role that AI can play in development by choosing the slogan, AI for development and prosperity. Uh, and this is how we structured the strategy. So it's around four pillars, namely um, AI for government. So how do we build on existing uh, digital transformation uh, efforts within the Egyptian government to then add uh, an AI layer on top uh, to uh, facilitate um, not only decision making but to kind of standardize workflows across uh, the different uh, government entities and to compensate a little bit for lack of training of, uh, of people and so on. Uh, the second one was um, the absorption of AI in various economic sectors 
and we chose um, a number of sectors like agriculture, healthcare, environment, um, and smart cities to uh, start with and to explore how we can maximize um, the, the use of AI to create value uh, in these sectors. And then the third one was around capacity building, of course, be it individual or institutional capacity building. And then finally, uh, the role that Egypt can play on the international and regional level um, with regards to the, the various um, recommendations and guidelines and treaties and, and so on. Um, now, to talk about challenges, um, I think, we face pretty much the same challenges that any developing country uh, would face when uh, when thinking about implementing an AI strategy. Um, the thing about AI is that it builds on so many existing elements and foundations. And if you don't have these elements in place, then you're automatically disadvantaged. You're disadvantaged in, in rankings and the various AI development indices and so on, but you're also uh, far behind in how quickly you can adopt and, and, and promote AI. And I've kind of structured these, uh, these challenges or these foundations along three main areas, uh, namely human, institutional, and cultural. So for example, if you are implementing AI in um, a country in the global south that has 40, 50% illiteracy rate, um, then this is a very different place to start from than uh, going to a country that already has 100% literacy rate. Most people go to college and they already um, know how to, at least on a basic level, deal with technology. And therefore, you can just build on uh, the knowledge that you can assume is there. The picture looks very different in developing countries where quite often you have to uh, teach people how to read and write first, then you have to teach them about uh, you know, the basics of um, technology and even if they're just going to be normal users, and then you can start uh, with AI, which is a very difficult road, um, not only in the sheer number of people that you need to educate, but also in finding people who can teach them and finding the tools that, that can do the teaching. So teaching the teacher or training the trainer becomes a huge priority if you want to implement this at scale. And then, of course, you need to also institutionalize that mindset across uh, organizations as well, be it in the public or private sector. The second area, the, the institutional bit, uh, is, um, or let me actually tell you how we, we address that or are addressing that, that first one in Egypt, namely um, capacity building and the importance of kind of catching up. Uh, so what we did was we developed uh, a pyramid-shaped strategy, where Egyptians, of course, everything has to come in the shape of a pyramid. So we developed two pyramids um, based on the roles that uh, different people and different organizations can play in an AI-driven ecosystem. And this comes in the form of uh, either very tech-centered roles. So we've broken down a typical AI development team, whether it's data scientists, data engineers, machine learning experts, um, even um, architects, QA specialists, ML ops specialists, and so on. Um, and we came up with a structure of how many we would need and what we would need to teach them. This is to build kind of the, um, the ecosystem of AI development in the country. The other pyramid has to do with non-technical roles. Uh, first and, and most importantly, domain experts. So uh, people who work in the domains in healthcare and agriculture, in uh, infrastructure, in whatever domain you're trying to implement AI in, and can help you uh, absorb uh, these technologies and, and decide uh, on where the data is, what the, the type, um, the, the right results are, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is uh, and, and this pyramid also includes things like uh, teaching AI at the highest levels of business and government, so AI for leaders, essentially, but also the wider base of uh, children in schools and in universities. Uh, when do we start teaching them about AI? In what way uh, can they start using it? And so on. So this is the first one, the, the capacity building one. And of course, it was accompanied by a, a large number of, of intensive TOT programs as well, as I said. The, the institutional part is, um, again, if you don't have 
an existing digital base in your government, for example, if most of the government operations still uh, work with pen and paper, then you have a very hard time thinking about how to introduce AI, whether from a practical perspective or even from people's mindset, because you also need to re-engineer those processes behind, uh, behind that transformation. And um, in Egypt, we were lucky that we had already started a digital transformation of the government. Um, and so adding that AI layer in some sectors wasn't that big a jump, but in, in some sectors that are still uh, relatively traditional, it is and will be for some time a huge challenge. So this is the, the second, second thing that, that you need to take care of. The third thing has to do with the cultural readiness of a society to embrace AI. And unfortunately, um, when we talk about AI, we talk about equality, we talk about leaving no one behind. But unfortunately, AI does exactly that. It amplifies the differences and the disadvantages that already exist in society. And uh, Egypt and all developing countries are no different than that. So if we're talking about uh, people who can't read and write or people who are already disadvantaged because of their economic status or because they live in remote areas or anything like that, then they will automatically have less access to AI education. They'll have less access to opportunities. And then you have to kind of flip the, the argument and say, OK, so how can I use AI to reach those uh, people in those remote areas? And we've implemented this through um, a number of um, programs, including uh, things like um, remote uh, healthcare diagnosis or um, online learning for, for different groups and so on and so forth. So, uh, but, but the cultural issue has to do with, with more than that. It has to do with society's perception of things like ethics, uh, of the legal and regulatory framework that already exists in the country which again, you have to fix or you have to build before you can um, adapt it to AI. So if you don't have the right laws for cybersecurity, for uh, intellectual property, for uh, e-commerce, fintech, whatever the case may be, then again, it becomes a big jump to uh, start legislating for AI suddenly. And that kind of takes me to the, the second part of Thomas's question, which is the role of international organizations and uh, the role that developing countries can play in that global context of AI regulation and, and uh, ethics and, and related discussions. And I have to say that um, I'm a little bit skeptical about the possibility of having a global treaty for AI, just having seen, and as Jan mentioned, uh, multilateral uh, negotiations are always extremely hard, but the problem is that they end up giving us the least common denominator of everything that no one necessarily disagrees with, which is normally something that is very, very written down. Um, from a developing country's perspective, there's the additional challenge that there's this perception of these negotiations and these treaties always being driven by kind of the West. So talking about the EU, and yes, I know the Council of Europe is different from um, from uh, the EU, but there's this perception that it still represents European countries, um, or coming from the US, that it's kind of trying to impose a certain set of values and priorities that don't necessarily correspond with those in developing countries. Um, I realize I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll wrap up and we can uh, talk later in the Q&A. But just to say that uh, my kind of suggestion or my preference would be to empower regional coalitions and regional clusters of countries that are like-minded that can come together and have their own regional treaties on AI and uh, the governance and the legislation and so on, and then to build bridges between those. Um, this would be the, the first suggestion. The second suggestion is for international organizations to focus much more on weaving the story of AI ethics and legislation into the story of development, because that is really the, the main priority for developing countries is how can this technology help us achieve our goals rather than how can we mitigate its risks and so on. Of course, risk mitigation is important, but it's not the priority, because if they don't realize the value behind the technology, they're not going to think about adopting it anyway. So I'll stop here and, uh, and we'll uh, hopefully continue uh, in the Q&A. Thank you very much.
Thank, thank you very much, Sally, for this interesting, although a little uh, too long uh, presentation, but uh, I think it was important to, to get uh, uh, that view also from, from a one uh, of the developing countries. Um, so I will move as quickly as I can to the next speaker, which is from Japan, um, <coughs> and asking you to, to stay within, within the time that, that we agreed. Uh, professor Susumu Hirano is a, a, a professor at the um, uh, the Faculty of Global Informatics of Chuo um, University in Tokyo. He has been also a member, he uh, did a lot of things, I just mentioned that he has been a member of the AI expert group of the UNES, uh, of OECD and a member of the Council for Social Principles and Human-Centric AI in the Cabinet Office of the Government of Japan. So, uh, Sushumu, please, over to you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Schneider, for kindly introducing me to uh, the audience. It is my honor to be given this opportunity. Ha have you heard my voice? Yes, we can, can hear can you. you yes, we can. Yeah, yes. Thank you. So, and uh, it might be difficult for me to show you my my video, my face, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so I I will keep on speaking because the time is limited. And just a moment and. Uh, I'd like to share. Oh yes, uh, uh, how they do. <laughs> and I'd like to share uh, my my my. Just a moment. Can I share my slide using my device, or maybe you can show uh, them? That, uh, that the should slide. actually work. If not, maybe Vadim, our re remote guy, can can do that. Oh, just a moment. Yes. Uh, can you see the slide now? It, yes, we can. Yes, thank yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, yes, uh, in Japan, AI is regulated under the so-called soft law, such as uh, guidelines or principles. Top AI principles are social principles of human-centric AI, which were published by Council for Social Principles of Human-Centric AI under the Cabinet Office. And uh, there are two more specific and concrete principles and guidelines in Japan. They are AI R&D principles and guidelines, as well as AI utilization principles and guidelines. Those principles and guidelines are published by Conference Toward AI Network Society under MIC, the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. Please see the lower left portion. It is recommended that AI-related corporations and other entities should build and comply with their own self-regulations regarding development or usage of AI. They are encouraged to follow suit of the governmental principles. However, the social principle of the cabinet office is a little bit abstract or conceptualistic. Therefore, MIC's R&D and utilization principles and guidelines would be more helpful for corporations and entities to build their own internal rules. This slide shows some portions from AI utilization principles and relevant documents. Actually, the documents are very voluminous, but these documents are specific and concrete Therefore, they are helpful for corporations and entities to build their own internal rules. First feature of Japan's principles and guidelines is soft rule. Second, it has been prepared through multi-stakeholders participation. And thirdly, from the beginning, we aimed for building a global standard because we, the conference, expected that AI would cross borders easily. This slide depicts the, the historical development toward OECD AI principles and beyond their love. It began in 2016 in the bottom of this slide. I was the vice chairman of this conference, which prepared a tentative draft of AI R&D principles. Immediately after the tentative draft was prepared, G7 ICT ministers meeting was held in Japan. 
At that time, Madam Minister Sanae Takaichi showed the tentative draft to the other fellow ministers, and she proposed that G7 members should create common norms like these principles. Then the fellow ministers said, likes. Japan's position is an intermediate one, which is located between the precautionary principle and the permissionless innovation. On, on the one hand, we don't think that no norms are required. On the other hand, we think that strictly binding regulations could give chilling effects on the development of AI. Culturally and historically, Japan prefers to harmony, and the Japanese people and the corporations tend to comply with non-binding soft law. Why do Japanese tend to comply with soft law? I think the answer is peer pressure. For example, in Japan, there is no hard law which requires that the people wear masks under the recent COVID-19 environment. However, even today, almost all Japanese people still wear masks in public areas, such as in the public transportation or offices. As the first bullet point on the next slide show, actually many leading corporations voluntarily made their own internal rules given the governmental principles, guidelines, and OECD AI principles. However, I don't know as to whether SMEs have followed suit. In my personal opinion, the government should make further efforts to make them know the principles and guidelines published by the government and OECD. In addition, of course, corporations and entities should comply with the current enforceable law. In this context, I think American EEOC's efforts are helpful. It is my understanding that the EEOC is federal commission, which has its jurisdiction of employment discrimination. The EEOC pronounced that it launched an initiative to ensure that usage of AI and other emerging technologies in hiring or other employment decisions should comply with the currently enforceable anti-discrimination -disc laws. And it said, for example, that the EEOC would issue guidance on use of AI in employment decisions and that it would identify promising practices and so on. These efforts to make it sure that corporations' AI usage practices should comply with the currently enforceable law are very important, I think. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to make my presentation on AI governance in Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very interesting also to see cultural, how much cultural differences come into play when, when, with the use of different, uh, <clears throat> different instruments. Next, I will move uh, to uh, Gregor Stroin, who is a, a, a lawyer and a government representative from Slovenia. Um, he has also a, a large uh, uh, experience, in particular, when it comes to, to justice and court issues. He was the chair of the previous committee that Jan Kleisen mentioned, of the CAHAI, the first committee that spent two and a half years on laying the ground um, of, of the work that we are now undertaking, negotiating this convention. So, Gregor, please, over to you. Thank you. Dear now we can hear you. Excellent. Yes. Thank you for unmuting me. I will try to be brief, and I'm happy that both you and also Director Jan Kleisen have already provided a very good introduction to what Kahai did. Uh, what was the goal of Kahai? Basically, to connect the issues and understanding of AI between technical. Uh, community, legal community, political community, industry, and civil society, and provide a feasibility study for a potential 
instrument that would govern the design, development, and application of AI in line with the standards on human rights, rule of law, and democracy. And I will not go too much into the details of how we did the work, but mostly I would like to, or briefly, I would like to point out a couple of findings. And uh, I would like to refer to what uh, Madame Radwan rightly said, that there is a challenge to create an international or even global treaty on AI because it can go toward a minimum a common denominator. Well, at the same time, AI is perceived as a strategic and competitive tool. And precisely because of this, we need a common understanding and also guidance into what kind of a society we want, because it is a technology that will shape not only our present, but also our future. And it is responsibility of international community of all the countries to find a solution that goes well beyond the common denominator. Of course, it's hard, but let me give you an example that why do we even need regulation? Why do we need to go beyond ethics and recommendations? And what are some of the priorities? And uh, let me address one persistent myth. Regulation does not inhibit innovation. As it happens, it just might be easier to prove that it is the lack of regulation that is currently inhibiting innovation by entrenching the existing monopolies while simultaneously stimulating optimization of authoritarian or inegalitarian tendencies. Consider the historical example of automotive, uh, automotive industry of cars. In the beginning, there were no specific regulations. They have developed over time due to clear needs which have emerged in the society. We need safety. We need seat belts. We need traffic rules. We need clear rules on liability. We need lower emissions. Individual ideas for optimizations were slowly shaped into recommendations, and these were subs subsequently adopted as binding rules to increase their actual effectiveness. Over a century ago, there was competition in the development of both electric and gas-powered vehicles, but it was not regulation that stifled that innovation. The market chose gas for business reasons. Partially, that was also linked to the existing monopolies of the time, the oil industry. This brought consequences, and it is now, of course, coming back full circle. Climate change and civil society have influenced governments to impose rules, and the market is now choosing to readapt re by moving toward electric vehicles. And we cannot afford another century, and probably not even a decade, to arrive at similar conclusions with AI. We need smart regulation with coherent, comprehensive, and systemic solutions to avoid unintended and sometimes also intended consequences. So this is why we need binding and effective legal instruments, and we need them fast. But we should be prudent as to what we bind ourselves to, and not too haste as to make waste. We need a legal framework that provides certainty. Building blocks of various initiatives should be at least com um, compatible, if not complementary. If not, we might well be counterproductive in our efforts with the fragmented development. We must focus on realistic problems and not on fiction. Discussions about various hypothetical risks of AI can often function as a distraction. Most challenges currently remain on a very human level and are still not adequately solved. We should not be techno-solutionists and allow additional pseudoscience to creep into governance. We should not be naive in expecting too much from AI's capabilities or even create new scaled up inequalities by failing to ask the right questions, use AI as an alibi or deflection from personal responsibility in decision-making or accept it as fait accompli that cannot be avoided or changed. We need transparency especially on what is used, how, and for what purpose. Some applications may prove to present unacceptable risk and should be considered for moratoria, such as AI systems using biometrics to identify, categorize, 
or infer characteristics or emotions of individuals, in particular if they lead to mass surveillance or AI systems which are used for social scoring to determine access to essential services. We do not need explainability for all types of applications, but we do need better disclosure and understanding of the capabilities and limits of particular uses. We do, we do need auditability and ac accountability, especially if we are sincere about our desires to increase the implementation of solutions and their quality. We need to prevent and mitigate risks and avoid strengthening some of the existing trends. Effective compliance mechanisms and standards must be ensured through independent and impartial supervisory authorities. Adequate risk classification and impact assessment mechanisms are necessary and must be consistently, systematically, and regularly applied throughout the life cycle of applications. They also need to be proportionate to the nature of the risk they, they pose and carefully balanced with the abilities of the developers and expectations of the society. Too high compliance burdens can, for example, provide an advantage to larger established actors or stimulate avoidance and further obfuscation. And finally, we should avoid or stop emphasizing the desire to be first in regulation. We should rather strive to create rules that are clear, effective, robust, and most importantly, enabling, both for designers and developers, as for our fundamental rights and values. So this is the direction also where we are going with different initiatives in Europe. And in 2020, that was the year when the need for regulation was clearly established. Last year, in 2021, key elements of this regulation were elaborated and defined. And this year is the year when verbal commitments are being put to the test. Hopefully, next year, we will find effective instruments come to, into place next year. So back to you, Thomas. Thank you very much, Gregor. Um, so I'll move to the last speaker uh, of the panel, and I hope that we'll have at least a few minutes left uh, for, for interaction. Um, it is Marisa Jimenez Martin. She uh, works for Meta, the company that used to be called Facebook some time ago, in case you don't know uh, what Meta is. Um, Meta is also participating inter alia in the work of, of our committee as an observer, like others. Um, but uh, her uh, presentation will go a little beyond AI, but also uh, show us a little bit about other emerging uh, technologies. So uh, over to you, and please um, don't go over time. We would like to have at least a few minutes of, of um, uh, interaction at the end. Thank you very much. Of course, and thank you very much for the invitation today. It is really a pleasure for me to be here at the IGF, and in particular, in an event that is uh, co-organized with the Council of Europe. Indeed, Meta is a supporter of the work of the Council of Europe. In particular, we're a partner in its work on the CAHI first and then now in the CAI. Perhaps we can talk a little bit more about what Meta, where it stands on regulation and AI later. Um, you asked me uh, to do a little presentation on the metaverse, and it's important because that will also open your minds and ears to the next generation where AI also will have a, an important role. But to what the others have said before, it is so important to um, get the regulation of the AI right, because it's on top of that, then they will have uh, new experiences and new uh, digital spaces such as the metaverse. So I will try to do it very, very quickly. Bear with me. I will share my screen now. Um, one moment. I hope you can see it. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Thank you. So very quickly, this is an intro to the metaverse. I will speak to you about what is the metaverse? Uh, what are the technologies that power the metaverse? Uh, a couple of use cases and what it takes from our perspective to do responsible innovation. That will probably fit in 
really well afterwards to the discussion that we will all have. So the metaverse is really a set of digital spaces where an individual will be able to connect with others in, in, in that immersive fashion. And the reality, in the reality, the metaverse is the new evolution, is the evolution of the internet. And that is the sense of presence uh, in that world that is so different from what we are used to today. Um, that will mean that you can travel to the past, to the future, to other places. Uh, for, for example, let me just give you here, you could be with your friends and then all of a sudden go to the top of the hill or learn about uh, history or even play chess with someone that is absent, but is very close to you. That's really the, the essence of what the metaverse will be in the next five to 10 years. But how do we get there? And this is what is important also for the, for the discussion that we're having today. It is not really a revolution, it's an evolution. So we go from in the 50s from computing and with mainframes to the 80s with PCs and, and computers to the two uh, to the two thousands, where we have the mobile internet, which was really a breakthrough, and we have gone there for from text to images to uh, to video. So obviously, the evolution, what's logical, is that we will find then the metaverse. And what's also different in the metaverse from the internet today is that you can access it for a variety from a variety of devices that are very different to each other, like like a smart glasses or, or a VR headset. Now, what are the technologies that power to the metaverse? Of course, AI is part of that, right? So we call them XR or extended reality. The extended reality is what covers all these technologies from wearables and computing technology, AR and VR. So AR and VR, so augmented reality. The augmented reality is a computing technology that overlays digital images and also puts animations uh, into somebody's view of the real world. So you are extending the reality. The reality is the main element in augmented reality. Now we've got virtual reality, which is usually talked to together with, a with AR, but is very different because here where you're creating is a simulation of the virtual world where you can explore it in 360 degrees. So let me just give you really quickly two examples, one with AR and one v with VR, the, the principle of the, at the beginning of the metaverse. And it is very much the similar examples and similar use cases, but one uses AR and the other one uses VR. So this is an example with medical training. So immersive training, it has an enormous potential in the metaverse. We, we have worked at Meta with the WHO Academy to bring a 20 minute training for, uh, for professionals in healthcare to put on and off their, their uh, protective wear, which is so important, right, for the safety of our healthcare professionals. And we have already seen a 23%, not, not 23%, but actually 23 times less cost uh, in, in the delivery of these trainings for the WHO. So you can imagine what that actually means. The same thing with emergency preparedness. Now this is VR. So here you're creating a simulation quite as if it were in real life in a situation of distress where you would have paramedics and medics and the victim and the parents being very worried, obviously, about their son in that with serious burns. Training a medical staff and paramedicals to be as ready as possible in a situation of distress. This is really the potential of VR. Now, here's my boss To You all recognize uh, Mark Zuckerberg. The, the metaverse cannot be built by one company. In fact, if we can, we believe that the new version of the internet is going to have creators and developers at the front and center and not so much platforms, platforms as well, but it's going to be driven by the creative community as well. And that has an enormous impact as well when we talk about policies and standards and regulation on the, on the metaverse. How do we build this responsible innovation? For us, these are the, the, the principles in which we think the metaverse should be built in, which frankly, I could put these principles uh, against AI as well, because there's an enormous digital opportunity, but it has to be an opportunity for all. And therefore equity and inclusion play a fundamental role. Privacy, it has to be a place that is safe, where integrity is safeguarded, and last but not least, voice um, and inclusion. 
we are at the IGF, so I cannot stop without talking about two things that are fundamental. We're fundamental to the internet, will be fundamental to the metaverse, which are governance and technical standards, interoperability. So before we talk about who controls the metaverse, uh, rather than the metaverses, by the way, we think is the metaverse, and there's one metaverse in different digital spaces, we need to really work on make it the make it interoperable. So it will take it will take some time from five to 10 years. But first and foremost is that we need to focus on the development of standards, a collaboration between the industry creators and also policymakers, have many conversations, get the AI work right, right? So back to the to the subject that we have today, and investment, investment in skills uh, and, and investment in, in support of those who will make it possible. And uh, with that, I am finished. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation and also for being so short. So we have a few minutes left um, and uh, given that the speakers have all been participating remotely, I would like to give the opportunity to the people in the room here to, to express, uh, to make short comments or ask questions. Um, who wants to start? Just hold your hand up. Um. Yes, please go ahead. And introduce yourself in one second so that we know who you are. There we go. Uh, Peggy Hicks, I'm with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. Um, I wanted to go back to the colleague from the Council of Europe's um, point about the Council of Europe approach versus the EU AI Act approach and one focusing on products versus process or the use cases. And I wanted uh, perhaps to ask him and others to pick up how that plays out with particular sectoral uh, uses of, of AI and whether while we're, there was such a stress on needing to move quickly on some of this, are there places where, while we believe in a, the global approach, it might make sense to develop some sectoral solutions that might be um, easier to get consensus on and move forward on more quickly? Maybe Gregor forgives me that I, I uh, answer this as I'm sitting here in this room. Uh, to, to quickly uh, explain the difference between the, the EU AI Act is a tool that is regulating a market, a digital market in the EU and whoever is active in that market. Whereas the Council of Europe's convention is, is uh, something that is a legal instrument that is open to also non-European countries to adhere, that tries to establish a few principles on a principle basis, like between the Human Rights Convention and then specific instruments. But what it is clear that this is not a sole instrument, so that will have to be complemented by a number of sectoral instruments. They can be binding or non-binding. The Council of Europe, OECD, others have already developed sectoral instruments on, on data protection, on health, on the judicial system. So it needs to be several instruments playing together. It also needs self-regulatory instruments from the industry, it needs civil society academics. So all of this needs to play together and the Council of Europe Convention is just one important element like the EU AI Act for, for the EU. I hope that answers your question. Other questions or comments? Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Michał Bukowski, Polish Government Administration. I've got a question uh, for the Meta. Uh, there was a stress, the fact of the importance of the interoperability uh, when building a metaverse. And uh, in the case of the e European interoperability framework, uh, this framework stresses the use of the open standards in the, in the foundation of interoperability. So I would like to ask a question, what is the Meta approach for reusing or developing open standards for metaverse? Thank you. Thank you very much for this very good question. Marisa, if you would like to answer this. I don't know if somebody needs to unmute her. Yes, now we see. OK. Um, Indeed, uh, the idea of open standards is fundamental both to the AI and and the future of the metaverse. Absolutely, open standards and interoperability. Now, how exactly to do it? I would not know how to tell you uh, in the, uh, here, but indeed, the philosophy around it is that they need to be open standards. 
Thank you very much. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, hello, um, thank you for this interesting session. Um, my name is Jaudi Kar. I'm a student at the Technical University of Munich, and I have a question that um, for someone that works in a company, um, I would like to know if you could share some good and bad practices to organize governance of artificial uh, intelligence in the private sector. Um, like, how could you manage uh, to like the um, division of the work between a compliance team and a technical team. Uh, what do you think is the best alternative to organize like AI governance in yeah in the private sector? That's my my question. Thank you. Thank you. If we have somebody f working for a, a company that is developing or using AI in the room, of course that would be nice. Otherwise, I'll turn to to Marisa again. I guess. We seem to have no industry representatives uh, in the room. So, Marisa, if you could answer um, the question, thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's a pity that we don't have any other industry participants. That's something that perhaps is is a takeaway uh, from from this workshop. I think it's an extremely interesting uh, interesting question, and there's no no easy answer. I can tell you how we do it at Meta. So, indeed, AI is so fundamental. Uh, to what we do, right? That we have to have that governance uh, model internally. So what we do is that because we believe so much in AI, we, we know the opportunities that it has for our products and services, but we also know that it has challenges as well. So we cannot, that's the first thing, is to understand that it is a, a, it, it is a great technology, but it has its challenges. So the way that we have done is we have a framework divided in five pillars. One is uh, um, deals with fairness and inclusion. So to make sure that there are systems by which our ML engineers can detect when there is a bias, because sometimes these things happen. So that in the in the in the AI models, because once these are detected, then it can be addressed. Um, we have teams that deal with transparency and control, uh, robust uh, robustness and safety, accountability and governance as well as privacy and security. These are all multidisciplinary groups, right? So it's not that it's only engineers or technical people or legal people or policy people or business people. The, they all come uh, together. So this is important in a, in a, in a company uh, that you get governance models where that, that have people from different parts of the company. Another uh, thing that we have developed is, is something called the open loop. And the open loop is a, a, a prototype where we internally look at different requirements and try to test them and see how they would actually, um, the, the results that it would render. So when we have some regulatory requirements, we'll probably do it with the Council of Europe requirements too, is to see how what, what effects they would have in, in our work. So it is, it is a wonderful question. I would imagine that e each company will uh, define it uh, in a different way, but it doesn't sit in one part of the company only like privacy or safety, or it is multidisciplinary. Back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, there's another person wanting to take two more. Uh, I, d I don't, I, um, my uh, IGF account is, um, is a catastrophe, so I cannot log in on the, on the Zoom thing because I don't have the link. So apologies for that. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, Lee McKnight, Syracuse University. Um, from what we've just been hearing, um, I will, I'll just say what I've, I've been advocating for some years, uh, ethically certified AI developers. Otherwise, we don't really know. While it sounds like Meta's practices have improved significantly, and I know other people inside Meta that are doing much better in many different dimensions, for those outside of the company to have confidence in the actual output of any of these ML models, it might help. I have been advocating for years, uh, a ethically certified AI developers. Now the question is, could that be added to any of these uh, instruments that have been discussed today as perhaps an addendum or add-on at a national level or international level? Thank you. Who wants to take the answer to this from the remote, from the panelists? Yeah. 
If not, uh, I'll just quickly try to say something that um, the Council of Europe instrument, for instance, is, and we, we are still discussing whether we call it the convention or a framework convention in particular to, to make sure that that is an umbrella that should be fit for as many countries as possible and then leaving room to implementing things on national level in a given uh, cultural, as, as Sally has explained, in a given cultural context, in a given institutional context. Of course, there's, there's a, a challenge to basically create a shared umbrella and at the same time be flexible. So we'll, we'll see where we end up with, but maybe that. Just to add, then, I would suggest that every nation should have ethically certified AI developers, or I would worry for that nation that doesn't. Thank you. Um, let's take one final uh, uh, person to, to take the floor. Thank you. Okay, pressure to have the last question. Uh, I'm Katrin. I'm from the German Youth IGF, and I also have a question for Marisa. <laughs> and the question would be, like, in Germany, we see a lot of hate crime on the different meta platforms. And, like, we fear that they will even be stronger and continue, like, in the metaverse. And the question would be how you want to address those hate crimes via AI specifically. Um, yeah, that would be interesting to hear about. Thank you. Over, over to you, Marisa. How do you deal with in, incitement to violence and hatred in, in the metaverse? Thank you. You are still muted. Can somebody unmute? Now it's now. good. <laughs> yeah, you control from the room. So it's uh, excellent. So I think, so there's two questions here, I think, uh, or I'd like to take it in two parts. One is, is how does AI work uh, to to detect and, and to address uh, hate crimes or hate speech or harmful content in general. And, and another uh, question is, how does that, how do we do, we will we'll deal with that in the metaverse? So the first question I would say is that the AI has evolved significantly over the years. So to give you an example, today we detect uh, hate speech. So let's put hate speech. We detect hate, spe hate speech. Uh, 90 more than 90 percent of the time before it is actually reported to us. In 2017, it was only 24 percent of hate speech was detected before anyone reported to us, and that is, you know, in its immensely great majority thanks to AI. So it is the evol the evolution of technology and classifiers that have allowed us to deal with harmful content, to detect it, and remove it. Um, in, a, in a much more significant and efficient way. And, and so that's the power of the technology. The technology alone cannot solve a problem, but, but it just shows that, that when these classifiers work better, we have better results. So that's one, uh, just to answer a little bit on the, the role of AI. When it comes to the metaverse, I think that this, the, the the way in the regulation and the way in which we deal with in the internet of today will have to continue for uh, platforms and the services of today. As we move to the metaverse, we will have to see what are the actual rules that make sense for that metaverse, because it will be different digital different digital uh, services, and it will not, in the same way that this is not uh, one platform vision and realization that it is something for many companies and 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 society in general. We will have to see then what additional rules we have to bring there. Um, in the only thing that I, you know, I don't have everything figured out, but definitely is, is a wonderful question that we have to, all to address that is not, you know, uh, that is not given. But one thing I'd like you to leave you with is that we think that the metaverse, in many instances, the metaverse will look less like the 2D internet and it will be closer to the real world. And that means that many of the rules on governance, on addressing hate speech and harmful content will have to be different or we'll have to, we'll have, to have additional ways of addressing them. We'll have to give more responsibility uh, as well to developers, to creators, uh, provide better tools for everyone so that we can deal with these issues. But it is true that it, it is difficult uh, and it's, it's definitely going to be a challenge because of that nature of what we're, of what we're all building. Um, so I don't know if that, if that answers your question, but it's a very interesting one where we have, we will have to continue discussing. 
Thank you very much for, for this last statement. And uh, so I'll, I'll quickly wrap up. I will not take more than 55 minutes, of course. Um, so now, basically, as a, as a historian, uh, I, I know that some people used to say the technology of the future will help us to solve the problems that the technology of the past created, uh, which is not completely wrong, but it's also not the, the whole of the history. I think technology can be very useful uh, to make our lives better, but in the end, we need the people to talk to each other, to agree on how they want our societies and economies to progress. And uh, I hope that we contributed a little bit to this dialogue, to this discussion here with this session. So thanks all very much for, for being here online and here physically and looking forward to a next occasion. Thanks very much.